so we've been talking about that if A is M by N, then obviously A transpose is N by M. And you can consider that A is a function that is mapping Rn into Rm. So A goes this way. A transpose can be considered going the other way, but our primary, the primary thought here is we're focusing on A. You know, A is multiplying stuff. That's really what we're looking at. Now, A transpose can be thought of as going backwards, but its main purpose is to try and understand A and how A itself uh, manipulates in terms of breaking up the left-hand side into these components that I've written, written before in this particular way. where we have two orthogonal subspaces on the domain. We have two orthogonal subspaces on the codomain. Uh, we have the zero object of Rn that's shared. We have the zero object of Rm that's shared. We have the null space of A. We have the null space of A transpose. Uh, this is the range of A. Considering that we're focusing on A, you know, we have the range of A. Um, on the other hand, you would say that this is called the range of A transpose, but if you're focusing on A, if A is the thing that is most interesting to you, the range of A transpose is better thought of to focus on A as, so we can think of the range of A transpose, if we're going to focus on A, as A's row space as columns. All right. Um, so whenever we're thinking about A times X, this multiplication. I am multiplying by matrix A. I'm multiplying a, a vector by matrix A. I can interpret this now in a new physical way. It's taking nth dimensional space and moving it to nth dimensional space. The left hand side from your domain has two orthogonal components. The null space of A and then I take the row space of A, write it as columns and that's the range of A transpose. And those are orthogonal, yeah, those are orthogonal subspaces and they're orthogonal complements of one another. And then we say, hey, it goes. Well, where does it go to? Well, everything on the left, the entire space of the left, this entire space, everything on the left is simply going to get mapped to this space right here, the range of A. But the range of A is really the What's another word for the range of A? The column space of A, right? Which is what you would do. You would take A's columns that are independent, make it a basis, and span it. And that's what you would get. So if everything on the right goes to that little box on the right hand, everything on the left goes to that little box on the right hand side, the left is broken into two orthogonal complements, the null space, the range of A transpose, which is easier to think of as what's the row space, write it as columns, that's that space. Um, the matrix A always does this physical thing. So no matter what A you pick, it's going to manipulate the space into these parts. And we're going to study these parts and, and ask, well, knowing that I have these parts, is there anything that's interesting to me to, to think of A as an action? So um, probably the easiest way to do this is to, let's take A that was given in the last exam. 1, 2, 3, and then negative 2, negative 4, negative 6, and then negative 1, 1, 2, and then negative 1, 4, negative 1, and spits out. If I do my row ops and I put it into uh, reduced row echelon, 1, negative 2, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, so we do all this sort of work. And I ask for things like, okay, 
on here I asked for the column space. Well, the column space would say, hey, the dependency equations of the U are the same as the dependency equations of the A. So the column space is which ones of these are linearly independent? So you look at U. Which columns are linearly independent? One and three. One and three. So which columns are independent of A? One and three. So what's the column space? Use one and three, right? And so we can go through all of that. And what's going to happen here is I could say, hey, you know what the range of A is? It's the column space of A, but that's just simply the span of the first, one, two, three, and negative one, one, two. Well, what's the range of A transpose? Well, that's just simply the row space of A as columns. What's the row space of A? One, negative two, zero, one. Zero, zero, one, two, and that's all zeros. I don't use it, right? So it's the span of the row space written as columns, which is one, negative two, zero, one, zero, zero, one, two. The null space of A, what did you do? To find this one, you would take U, you would augment it with zero, zero, zero. We would continue the process, and we would solve this, and you would get all X's are equal to this you would get a 2 alpha minus beta a alpha, I'm just copying down what I already did on the algebra, so minus 2 beta and beta. So really, if I look at this, the null space of A is simply the span of two vectors, 2, 1, 0, 0, and negative 1, 0, negative 2, 1. Next, I could note, okay, what was supposed to happen? This space and this space are supposed to be orthogonal complements. That was the fundamental. A has fundamentally broken up these spaces into subspaces. There's two fundamental subspaces that exist, the null space and the range of A transpose, which is the column, which is the row space is columns. All right, what's supposed to happen in here is the null space of A's orthogonal complement is supposed to be the range of A transpose. Is that true? All right, what, what did we had? Um, we could actually check this. What did we have for the null space of A? The null space of A was that span of 2, 1, 0, 0, and negative 1, 0, negative 2, 1, and the range of A transpose, which was that column space, was the span, sorry, the range of A transpose, which is the row space as columns. I need to keep making sure my words are not getting overly confused. 1, negative 2, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 2. All right, so if I call him V1, and I'll call him V2, I'll call him V3, and I'll call him V4. What do I need to actually check? If the null space of A is supposed to be the orthogonal complement of the range of A transpose, what would that mean? Since these are the basis, these are the basis vectors of those spans. All right, first off, what is the dimension of the null space of A? Two, because it has two basis vectors. What's the dimension of the range of A transpose? Two, right, because it has two vectors here. So if I wanted to check this, all I, what would I have to show? That V1 transpose V3 is supposed to be what? Zero. That V1 transpose V4 is supposed to be what? And then V2 transpose V3 is supposed to be 0, and V2 transpose V4 is supposed to be 0. Is that true? Well, how do you do it? Well, you would just simply, hey, I'm going to take him, and I'm going to take him. What is the scalar product? Multiply common positions and add, right? What is 2 times 1? What's 1 times negative 2? And then 0 times 0, 0 times 1. So what did I get? 2. Minus 2, 0, 0. Add it, I get 
0. Hey, it worked. What about V1 and V4? What would, if I did my scalar multiplication, it would be what? 0, 0, 0, 0. 0. So what do I know? V1 is orthogonal to both V3 and V4. Since it's both those basis vectors, all spans are going to be orthogonal. And check the same thing on V2. Guess what? They're orthogonal. Everything in the one span is orthogonal to everything in the other span. Not only that, we had a nice little theorem here, which is I could actually, since we have everybody on this side and everybody on this side, we could actually use this to form a basis, A, right? There isn't a unique basis, right? There's lots of bases. But A basis for R4 could be what? Just all those combined. Just all those combined. So physically, what we could look at on this is if we would actually summarize this. So the summary. I could physically summarize this. If A was equal to what we were given, which of course I flipped the page. So if A was equal to 1, 2, 3, negative 2, negative 4, negative 6, negative 1, 1, 2, negative 1, 4, minus 1. If that's my A. This A will physically do the following. It takes fourth dimensional space spits out third dimensional space as I multiply by A. It takes two orthogonal complements, the null space of A with its orthogonal complement, which happens to be the range of A transpose, also thought of as the, as the row space of A written as columns. The zero object is shared, but that's zero, 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 zero. That's my zero object here. What's this zero object? It's zero, zero, zero. That's that object right there. This is the null space of A. But what's the null space of A? The null space of A is simply, this is the span of two, one, zero, zero with negative 1, 0, negative 2, 1. That was the null space of A. This is the range of A transpose. But what's the range of A transpose? The range of A transpose is the span of 1, minus 2, 0, 1, and 0, 0, 1, 2. And this is the range of A. Well, what's the range of A? It's the span of just those two vectors, which is the first two. One, two, sorry, the, the first column and the third column, because the second and the fourth column, and then this is just simply, that's the null space of A transpose. We could find that. I'm just not going to find it right now. OK. So that matrix has broken up fourth dimensional space into these orthogonal complements. The null space is the span of these two vectors, and so it's two-dimensional, and this is two-dimensional. In other words, what we've done is we've taken all fourth-dimensional space and say things can be thought of as from this plane and from this plane. How can I get to anywhere in fourth-dimensional space? I pick a vector out of this plane and a unique vector out of this plane. The sum of those two vectors gets me to a unique place in fourth-dimensional space. Now, if this is three-dimensional space, I automatically know the, the range of A is, is what dimensional? It's two. So what's the dimension of the null space of A? It's one. Why? Because this is three-dimensional. So I already automatically know at least that the dimension of this is equal to one because there's two and that's three, and so it has to add up together. I know it. Okay, what's its vector? I, don't, I really don't care right now. 
Actually, I would need something orthogonal to those two vectors. Without solving anything, how could you get one vector? We haven't done it yet. How could I get to one vector? I could use the cross product, right? The cross product would find a third vector that's orthogonal to two vectors within three space. That's a unique tool that I could use for three-dimensional space if I wanted to find it. I just need the direction, right, because I stretch it. So I wouldn't even, on the other hand, I could take a transpose and find its null space, but it'd be easier just to take the cross product of those two. Same direction. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, I just know it's dimensions one. And so what's going on? Any fourth dimensional vector at all multiplied by a is going to do what? All of these are going to go where? Right inside of that what? Plane. Is everybody okay with that? So I can imagine, what does A do? But the, on the other hand, what's kind of interesting about X is all X's are a unique vector out of the range of A transpose added to a unique vector that's in the null space of A. But if I multiplied that by A, what would happen to all of these vectors? They'd be go to zero. So really, when I multiply by A, all of these vectors become nothing. The only ones that really matter are, are these. I have a couple theorems here before I take that little idea and run with it. All right, so first off, definition. If you have two subspaces, say U and V are subspaces of a vector space W. And every W in the W vector space can be uniquely written as U plus V where U is of U, V is of V then we say W is a direct sum of UV and the notation we use is simply U O plus V is W. This is a, de this is a definitional Symbol. This is not an actual operator. This is not, I'm taking these two, this is a definitional symbol. What this symbol says is that <coughs> everything that's in one vector space W can have, I, I can uniquely, right, every one of these, every vector here, I can find uniquely something in U, uniquely something in V, and those sum uniquely, and those are the only two vectors that will sum up to the, the other third vector given out of that space. The theorem for this, using that notation, allows us to have the following theorem, which is R of N is always going to be a subspace direct sum with its orthogonal complement for any subspace S. That means if you take any subspace, its orthogonal complement is going to end up being their direct sum combinations for the entire space Rn. Well, if that works for any subspace, that means it's going to work for the null space. And one of the things that I did and I was using, but you actually, now that you have this, you can actually then prove the following theorem that the orthogonal complement of an orthogonal complement is just the original. Yep. Oh, is that the solar signal or is it already? Where? Context? This? Yeah. No, it's a completely new symbol. Okay. Right? This is not the, and XOR sometimes is like that, but, but this is, it's called O plus. It's the O plus symbol. It's just a, a plus with a circle around it. O plus is normally used for, um, here's a weird symbol that I need to pick <laughs> that doesn't look like any other. 
And so you'll see this symbol a lot when people think like, I want to re you redefine plus. Well, what's this? This will be x, y, plus y. Why? I don't know. I just wanted to do it. So it's normally the O symbols, like the O dot and the O plus tend to be normally, I need something that says this is not addition, this is not multiplication, it's my own variant. Now this symbol, like I said, is not an operator. It is a definition. It says, if you see this, it says, I can form any vector out of Rn by taking a unique combination. Unique means there's only one way to do this. A special unique guy out of S, a special unique guy out of S's orthogonal complement, where it sums to is unique. There is no other way to add this. Now, I mean, think about addition. This is kind of like pointing out, that's actually kind of interesting because what's one plus, if you would say five, how many ways can you add things up to five? If I only talk about integers, positive integers. I could have one and four, or I could have two and three. I have two different ways to actually get to five through addition. What is this saying? No. It's unique. You can't take a couple of things. Only a unique thing out of here and a unique thing out of here becomes this. There's no other way to do additions. It's unique. And this is where we got the idea of coordinates, right? Why do we have coordinates? Because what's special about a basis? A basis is special because a unique combination of those basis vectors forms a place. And that's the only way to get to that place. No other ways of mixing by addition, these basis vectors will get you to the same location. It's unique. And because of this, we actually do have that whole, um, the fundamental subspace theorem that I had been using. Which was that the null space of A's orthogonal complement is the range of A transpose, and uh, the null space of A is also the range of A transpose's orthogonal complement. Notice how I just, I wrote it both ways before. I knew that knowing that there was, this would not exist until this theorem came into being. And so I wrote it a little early. And then the null space of A transpose's orthogonal complement is the range of A, but that's the same thing saying that the null space of A transpose is simply the range of A's orthogonal complement. And that's because of that. All right. It's kind of interesting that, you know, a lot of things that we take for granted, that it's not true that my name is not Mark. So I'm not not Mark is to say that you're Mark because a not not gets you back to the original, right? But we do that logically. But on the other hand, that actually has to be provable. That a not of a not is actually a do nothing, right? And it would be kind of weird if like people sit there, it's pretty common, but there are branches of algebraic notations where if I would take a not of a not and not get back to the original. Right? And this is one, again, you had to prove it. The orthogonal complement of an orthogonal complement is just the original. You actually have to prove that for Boolean algebra in, uh, in discrete two. I make my students do that. That not not zero is actually still zero. It has to be provable. Anyways. All right. So, given all of this, this here is kind of the last part of what's necessary to understand what A is doing as an action. Now, what A is doing as an action, you know, we can take a corollary of this, and we're looking at A, and we're imagining that, okay, so what this is saying is because this span and this span are direct sums for R4. Which means that by saying that they're direct sums, it says that every vector in R4 can be thought of as 
a unique vector from here and a unique vector from here add together to get to, to this unique vector. And so we can go ahead and resolve those pieces out. And we can look at two sides of this. And So if this is vector if this is vector x that says that there is going to be and here's my null space here's my range of a transpose that means that there is going to be some unique vector here and I'll call him let's call him n and some unique vector here. Um, let's call him, I don't know, let's call him T. And so what happens on this problem is X is uniquely this N plus T. And then I've, of course, got this entire thing repeated over here. But now my null space and my range has changed. This is now the range of A, and this is the null space of A transpose, and this is my zero object. And so this is RM, this is RN, and we have a. So the direct sum theorem allows us to simply say that, okay, this is unique. And then the other thing it has is, well, if I was looking at the right-hand side, and I would get some, I don't know, some vector b. Now, I could look at uh, this B and say that it's made up of two things. Let's say that it's made up of this vector that is uniquely in here, whatever it is. I'll call him Z. And then some sort of vector over here. And... Let's call him, I don't know, why. And what I know is every, I, I also have uniquely, every B that exists in RM can be uniquely written into this Y plus Z. So that's what our direct sum allows us to do. Where Where is Y coming from? It's coming from the range of A. Where is Z coming from? It's coming from the null space of A transpose. Where is N coming from? It's coming from the null space of A. Where's T coming from? It's coming from the range of A transpose. So I suppose if I would have probably written it, if I want to stay somewhat consistent here in terms of who I'm pulling from. This still doesn't look like a double bar. Double T. There we go. All right. From looking at that, we can actually get two things. First, it'd be a corollary to these above theorems, which is if A is N by M and we have some sort of B that exists in RM, which is exactly what I'm looking at, right? I have an A, which is N by M, and let's get this right, M by N and B is in RM, the right-hand side. There's two possibilities. B is obviously either going to be in the range of A or not, right? So 
if we then try to study when AX could possibly be B. Now again, everybody on the left, no matter what you do, when you map it under A, goes only to the range of A, and that's it. So the first thing that can happen is we are all either going to have, and this is strictly or, not both, either there is some X on the left so that A of X is equal to B, really what is this saying? This is simply saying that B is in the range of A, right? One, it's either in the range of A, which really what we're saying is it has a solution, right? All this says is if you would consider this thing, what we really are saying that this says AX equals B has a solution. This only occurs if B is in the actual range. But what if B is not in that little part where it's the range of A? What if it's not there? Well, then what we used to simply say, we would simply say if it's not in, if it, if it doesn't have a solution, well, we used to say if B was not in the range of A, that AX equals B has no solution. And we would say that's inconsistent. Everybody okay with that? That's what we used to say. But we can actually go a little bit past that. Not only does it have no solution, that's true. There is no way to make this equality true. It's impossible. But I can actually get a little bit more information. Right? We can actually say, hey, solve this equation. And you can answer the answer. Like, for example, we have things like that. When does that parabola cross the x-axis? It doesn't. But if I consider the problem as if it's on complex space, I could actually say instead of real numbers, move myself up to complex numbers, it has two complex solutions, and I can find both of those. All right? In other words, across the complex numbers, this does have two solutions. And so in other words, we could reinterpret the problem. Oh, you only want real numbers? There's no answer. But mathematically, if we allowed such a thing as the thing that we call i, which is square root of negative 1, which doesn't exist according to real numbers, we'll call it imaginary, now I can go and do something. And so there is some information that exists beyond no answer. And this information that exists beyond no answer is the fact that there exists on this, if we would look back up this problem, if it is not in here, right, there is going to exist some sort of z that is obviously on the right-hand side, but such that two things happen. Uh, I, the first thing that happens is that A transpose of this Z is equal to zero. What is that actually telling you? Sorry, zero object. If A transpose times a vector spits out the zero object of Rn, where does it exist? In the null space. That means Z is in, this simply says that Z is in the null space of A transpose. And the second thing that we know is that this Z transpose B is not zero. But this is also saying that z, this here, is in the range of a's orthogonal complement. All right, it doesn't have any solution. All right, but I do know this. It doesn't have a solution, but there is going to be a unique vector somewhere in that space so that not only 
is A transpose times this thing, it's in the null space, but also it's not going to be orthogonal to the B. What we're saying here is, if I would physically look at this, if this is the range of A and B is not in the range of A, there is going to be some Y, sorry, some Z, that is orthogonal to the range of A such that these things aren't aligned. So really what we're doing here is saying that, okay, by Z being in the orthogonal complement of the range of A within B, that means B can unique, be, be uniquely written of what I wanted is eventually going to simply say that, hey, that means B has to be uniquely some sort of this Y and then plus the Z spits out the Z. Oops. The Y plus the Z spits out the B. This here will be used to try and rethink the problem solve AX equals B and go beyond, there's no answer. So this, this is a little bit of a pause and this will be continued in 5.3, which we'll do here in a bit. But um, we also can do the second thing that's of interest, we could also notice, that because this x can be uniquely written as, what was I using, t and n, is t plus n, where t was in the range of a transpose and this n was in the null space of A. And again, the range of A transpose is the row space of A written as columns. Because that is true, then A times X is really A times T plus N. And these are unique. But that means that this is really A times T plus A times N which is, well, what is A times N? Zero. It's zero because it's in the null space, right? Since N is in the null space, that simply says that's equal to zero. Not zero, but the zero object. Anything times a zero object is just simply A times T. All right. What's going on? Uh, think about it this way. if this is t, and when I multiply it by a, it goes over here to the range of a, and this new vector, whatever it is, is simply a times t. Everybody care with that? Now, if that's t, if I would take this little vector right here, Let's say that this has, I don't know, in it, let's say we have n1 is a vector and n2 is some other vector like this, right? That means if I took t and then added, say, n1 to it to get some sort of x1, where would this get mapped to? t under a gets mapped to that. Where would x1 get mapped to? Well, it's t plus n1, but n1 is from the null space of a, so where would that get mapped to? The exact same place. Well, what if I would have added, I don't know, n2, which would make this guy here x2. Where would he get mapped to? The exact same place. So what's happening is t goes here, exactly to this one particular spot t plus this little vector, which under a, a does nothing, right? Because when I multiply by a, it goes away. What happens? It gets mapped to the same spot. Well, let's add a different one. 
uh, that gets mapped to the same spot. <laughs> How many of these vectors? So I get a whole family of vectors that all get mapped to the exact same vector. Can you see why this is not invertible? What's the problem? Inverse says, if I gave you this, who did he come from? There's no one answer. I have an infinite number of vectors, which all went to this vector. So there's no way this is invertible. Now, obviously, when I just simply look at this, it's obvious A is not a one-to-one -one correspondence. To be a one-to-one, -one, I mean one-to-one -one and on-to, right? This is not a one-to-one -one correspondence. If it was a one-to-one -one correspondence, it would be an invertible function. This is not. Um, we've had something similar to this before from college algebra. Well, I shouldn't say college algebra, trigonometry. From trigonometry. Consider the following function. Ah, Sloppy, but what am I drawing? That's a sine of x. Is the sine of x an invertible function? Probably should have gone this way because... Is the sine invertible? Like, for example, what numbers map to 1? Who goes to 1? Pi over 2. Pi over 2 and... And 5 pi over 2, right? Which is, what am I doing? I keep adding what? 2 pi, two pi which is how many? 4 over 2. So what would be the next one? 9 pi over 2. Where do all of these get mapped to? Look at that, right? Every one of those numbers get mapped to where? 1. So I say, hey, you're at 1. Where did you come from? I don't know. Either pi over 2 or 5 pi over 2 or 9 pi over 2, right? or 13 pi over 2, or 17 pi over 2, or keep going forever, right? So we would call this, it doesn't pass the horizontal line test, so what would we say? It has, right, no inverse. But we have an arc sign. How in the world do we have an arc sign? We restrict the domain. We look at this problem and say, this has no inverse. So, fine. If it has no inverse, what we should do is just t go from here to here to here to here. Restrict my domain, then this has an inverse. And a lot of times we look at functions that are non-invertible and say, well, this is invertible under its natural domain. Well, what are you talking about? Well, when I look at it, this is what makes sense. So this is a natural domain that I'm talking about. Well, what we've if we apply that exact same idea to this problem, what's my issue? The issue is the null space. Everything I, every time I add a vector from the null space, I've added nothing and it goes to the same place. So where should I restrict my domain? I should only pick vectors from what? The range of A transpose. If I restrict the domain to just the range of A transpose and never allow a vector from the null space, that gets mapped to the range of A. Not only, and it now comes to the question is, well, is it going to be one to one and on to? Well, since this x is equal to t plus n uniquely, well, what is the range of A? The range of A is all AX such that X was in Rn. But AX is really A times T plus N, but that's equal to A times T, because that's really just a AN, which is zero. So, hey, you have AX, that's actually AT, and T is unique. And since T is unique, 
that actually says that this is equal to all a t, where the t uniquely comes from the range of a transpose. So if you restrict the domain to just the range of A transpose, A going from the range of A transpose to the range of A is one to one and onto. If it's one to one and onto, that means it's what? It's actually invertible. So physically what's happened here is do, 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 this here. So copy. So this is just another interpretation of what these things do. Normally, this all of this space, everything obviously is only going to go to the range of A. All of it goes there, but that's not unique. The problem is the null space. Everything in this direction allows us to have these, like this T plus N, right? That's where we get these, these vectors that kind of look like a family. They look like, hey, here's T, but T plus here goes to the same. This kind of branching, right? All of these, this entire family of vectors all go to the same place. So all we're saying is subtract all of those vectors and only have that one vector. So if we restrict ourselves to not this entire space, but only this, just like the sine gets compacted, and I can talk about the arc sine. If I restrict myself to this, which is the row space of A written as columns as a span, mapping to this, which is the range of A, this is invertible. And this inverse makes no sense if you try to apply it for anything outside of its natural domain and its natural range. So what if I have, for example, I can actually have, you can create this function, right? There'll be an inverse. So A can be thought of as not that. It can be thought of as this, that A. But now there'll exist some sort of A star inverse. And I'll have to do A star because normally when we write A inverse, right? We assume that it's square and it's an invertible function. That's this idea. But this is, it has an inverse, but this function only makes sense for this domain of this. On the other hand, it's just a matrix of numbers, right? And so it can multiply anything over here. It's just that if any of those things it tries to work on that are outside of this, it makes no sense. It's like, oh, what happens if I do this? That makes no sense. So I can find a unique block of, if this was five by four, I can find a unique four by five that will take this block uniquely back to this block under an inverse. Well, what does it do to the other stuff? I don't care, right? It, we restrict it. So it works for subspaces, not the entire space. All right, but we won't actually find such things. We'll just say, hey, look, isn't that neat? All right, let's go back to the problem. AX equals B. Can we solve it? All right, the answer first was yes, if B is in the range of A. And the answer used to be no if B is not in the range of A.
Now, this type of problem is normally going to occur on an overdetermined system, right? That's normally where this shows up. But on the other hand, what we're going to use is if I have RM, and I'm not going to write the null space for a second, I'm just going to write the range of A as if, it, as if it's some sort of plane right here, and then have B existing outside of it. Okay, the answer is no. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to reinterpret the problem. What I would like to do, and this is my idea, I don't like the word no. I want to do something. I'd like to have something. And so the concept behind my problem will be this. Uh, there is no solution. So no solution for AX equals B. And so this is out of Rn. But what I would like to do is, hey, could I find a x hat? So I'm going to make a new problem. It's a common technique in math. What's the answer to this problem? Nothing. Let's make a new problem that's kind of like my old problem that I actually can solve. So here's my new problem. Um, can I find an x hat so that when I take a times x hat, well, a times anything is always going to go where? Into the range. So can I take a times x hat? So here's my new problem. Find x hat on the left so that a times x hat, which is in the range, is close to b. So I'm going to turn this into what's called a minimization problem. How do you normally measure closeness? Distance. distance right? How do we do distance of vectors? Magnitude. But between two vectors, what would we do? The magnitude of their difference, right? So my idea for close, and so close would be what? I want to minimize the magnitude of Ax hat minus B. Now... The problem with that is, what is magnitude? It's the scalar product to the half power, right? Normal magnitude is equal to the square root, so, but magnitude of a vector is equal to the square root of a vector transpose vector. Don't like that. Minimize things with radicals. Radicals are ugly. But we know that if you minimize a quantity is same as, in other words, it would be the same location as minimize c squared. And so what we're rather going to do is magnitude of a vector squared is just simply the scalar product, which is nice. And so here's our new problem. A x equals b has no solution because b is not in the range of A. So, let's solve by minimize the magnitude of AX minus B 
squared. In other words, this, this is a new solve. This has no solution. Fine, it has no solution. I have a completely new problem. And the answer to this, x hat, is called the, all right, it's minimize. Another word for minimize is least. There's a power of two. I didn't, I didn't minimize the magnitude. I'm minimizing the square of the magnitude. It's called the least squared solution to AX equals B. AX equals B has no solution, but we call this the least squared solution. And the problem, the real problem that we did The real problem is a least squares problem for AX equals B. AX equals B doesn't have a solution. So let's rethink the problem. Let's find somebody that's as close as possible within the range. And so really when we look at this, um, it ends up being that what we're looking for, it ends up that this, which is the differences of the two, right? That's actually B minus AX, but because I have the arrow on the outside. Ends up being that this is minimized when that this is at 90 degrees, which is orthogonal. So the minimum occurs of the orthogonal, but to be the orthogonal means you, you're within the orthogonal complement of the range of A, which means you're in the null space of A transpose. And so it ends up being that the minimum occurs way back here when I did this. Any B can be written into these two components. And what I know is it ends up being that breaking it into the two components where one component is in the range of A transpose, the other component is within the null space of A transpose, ends up being that the projection, which is the part in the range of A, is the thing I'm trying to solve. And then I can reduce this problem by just simply multiplying by A transpose, because what would that do to the part that I didn't want? It'll make it zero. And it ends up, all we have to do for this entire problem is to solve AX equals B, which has no solution is to actually solve A transpose AX is equal to A transpose B. And that's it. And we'll finish that Y in next class. What happens here is, what does this do? This takes the non out, takes the, range, the part of it that's out of the range and makes it zero. And it does nothing to this, prob this side of the problem, so it has the same solution. So it's an, easy it's an easy tool, but with a bunch of theorems to get to this point. We still have to do those theorems. All right, that's it.